Happy Sabbath, everyone. We welcome you to this uh, wonderful presentation that uh, Early is going to be presenting to us. He's going to be talking about the, uh, the last three trumpets, the woe, 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 Papal Rome, Islam, and the USA. And we want to make you aware that none of the uh, images is our own. We just use it for information purposes. And we ask that uh, if you like this video, that you follow us on Facebook or Instagram and uh, like us on YouTube. We, uh, we want more people to see this. We believe that this is a message for our time. And please subscribe. So before we go into it, uh, let me open us up in prayer. Father, thank you for um, bringing us together to open your word, to study it, and to understand these wonderful prophecies that you've given to us, Lord. I ask that we may understand this and that we may know that you are coming soon, Lord. This is given to us as a hope that you are coming again to receive us, Lord. Bless Eerly right now and give him the words, give him the spirit so that it may be presented the way you want it to be presented, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh brother nick for this introduction so papal rome islam and the usa and the seven trumpets so just like nick stated before we're just doing the last three and um the last time i left uh people on revelation 8 verse 13 and I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which ye are yet to sound. So the last three tr trump trumpets are also called three woes. Why? Because they, they were even more terrible than the four, the four before them, and also they were different because a new religion is here introduced into the world, a religion of darkness. So let's get into it. So the last time we, we showed that the four barbarian tribe destroyed Imperial Rome. So by 476 AD, they couldn't continue. So now uh, we're going to see a shift also where Rome's going to be located. It's going to be in the eastern part. Byzantium uh, becomes a new Rome. And in 330, Constantine moved the capital from Rome to the Greek city of Byzantium and renamed the city Constantinople as the city of the Western Empire and crumble, Constantinople prospered. So we, you can see it here on the map, the green part. So the orange part, that's where uh, Western, uh, the empire was. But after they crumble, you see the east on the green part. And um, Emperor Justinian I, 526, uh, 27 to 565, Justinian came to the throne in Constantinople, and he dreamed to reconquer the land of the Western Rome Empire and ruling 
a single unite Roman Empire from his seat in Constantinople. So that's that was his dream. But something is different with Papal Rome. They no longer have their own army. So we can see it here. The Emperor Justinian and the Byzantine Empire, the rise of the papacy without an army of its own, but through the arm might of Emperor Justinian in Constantinople. And we can see that in Daniel 8, 24, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. So clearly there's a shift. Um, if you study the two dailies, on our channel, you'll get a, a, a better history. But now the elevation of the new form of Rome is papal. So now they're going to use a different army to help them conquer territories and impose their religion. So, uh, Carl, can you read the statement here? The western part of the former Roman Empire has been brought down in the first four trumpets. There's no emperor on the throne in the city of Rome anymore. Instead, the Bishop of Rome sits on the throne and rules over both the church and the government. Thank you. So we see here a government through the bishop. He's going to rule the church and the government but he's going to use some, somebody else's army. So you see how church and state is being formed just by the new um, elevation of Rome at this point. So, um, Nick, can you read about Pontifex Maximus for me, please? The, the whole text. Sure thing. Uh, says the origin of the name of this office is not entirely clear. It is generally accepted that the title Pontifex Maximus means supreme bridge builder. In practice, Pontifex Maximus possessed both political and religious power. At the end of the Republic's existence, the office of the supreme priest was in the hands of the most influential Roman families. The person who held this office was held in high esteem and was able to use his religious power to influence the politics of the country. The papal title Pontifex Maximus can be traced back in different forms to the ancient Chaldean times. When Medo-Persia conquered Babylon, the Babylonian religion was maintained, but after a revolt of the priesthood, the priests of Babylon were driven out of Medo-Persia and established themselves at Pergamon, taking with them their titles and vestures. The last pontiff king of Pergamum was Attalus III, who bequeathed his title to the emperor of Rome in 133 BC. In the 4th century AD, Christian emperor Gratian refused the title, and in the year 431 AD, the title was taken over by Damascus, bishop of Rome. So, so we see here the word Pontifex Maximus started from Babylon, multiplicity of God and, and his super, supreme bridge builder. So it, it makes me think of the vicar of Christ, just like Christ was the bridge between uh, the Father and us because we're in sin. So Satan is already planting seeds since Babylon and even though Babylon was overthrown by Middle Persia, um, Middle Persia kept going with that title, but they end up going to Pergamon because they were not well received. And after that, it got transferred pretty much to the Bishop of Rome. So a title that was pagan is becoming religious. So I don't know if somebody wants to say something. 
It also makes me think of Isaiah 58, repair of the breach. Mm. Um, as Christians, you know, we're, exactly. we're, we're repairs of the breach here, but he, they're calling themselves the bridge builder. Bridge builder. Exactly. Like a counterfeit that's, of that. that. That's a good point. So, so another statement, Carl, can you just read the statement on the right? The Pax Romana or Roman peace has ceased. Yep. It is a universal confusion, but wherever a bishop holds his court, religion protects all that is left of the ancient order. A new Rome ascends slowly above the horizon. The emperor is no more, but the pontifex maximus abides. He is now the vicar of Christ, or vicar of Christ, offering the old civilization of, to the tribes of the north. He converts them to his creed, and they serve him as father and judge supreme. So, so thank you. So we see the deception now that's entering in the church. And for the viewers, we've been doing the trumpet the last uh, two sessions. So now, from Tyra Tyra, God's going to apply the judgment on papal Rome. So we're going to go to the first, uh, the, for the fifth trumpet. We're going to go to the sixth and the seventh trumpet. So, for what's, again, um, yep. Uh, what's interesting is, um, and this was an excellent point brought out by uh, Leslie Harding. Mm -hmm. Whenever the trumpets began to sound, which was 395, mm -hmm. was it Theodosius, the Roman emperor, uh, maybe a little before that, declared that, the, that Christianity was the official religion of the empire. Wow. And so what is it? it I don't remember the chapter and verse, but uh, Leslie Harding says that uh, they, they worshiped new gods and then war was within the gates. And so hmm. the Roman religion changed from pagan to this falsehood of Christianity, the mm -hmm. mixture of, uh, paganism and Christianity. And look at what happened. There was war within the gates. They had the barbarians literally bring down mm -hmm. the Western Roman empire. And mm -hmm. then what we're going to be going over today is the Eastern Roman Empire being brought down hmm. because of it's the false be religion. False religion. So it's like God doesn't, God always stand for his church when he sees the mixture happening and exactly. he has to bring judgment. Thank you, uh, Nick, for this point. So we will go to the fifth and sixth and seventh trumpet. So the trumpet are divided into groups and each judged by something like himself. So um, here again, so now the fifth and the sixth trumpet brings attacks on the eastern part, where there is still a Roman emperor ruling. By the end of the sixth trumpet, the eastern Roman empire is destroyed completely also. So um, the fifth trumpet, the first war, Turkish Islam, the beginning of Islam under Muhammad. So um, we see here the angel represent Muhammad. So we're just going to go to Bible text now. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Revelation 9 1. So what it represents here. So, um, Carl, can you read the yellow statement only? Yep. We learn from Islamic tradition that on several occasions when Muhammad saw the spirit, he would be so frightened, he would run home to his wife and ask her to cover him with clothes. I was called again and raised my head, and there on the throne in the open atmosphere, he... Um, Gabriel, peace be upon him, was sitting. I began to tremble on account of fear. I came to Khadija and said, wrap me up. They wrapped me up and threw water on me. 
and then I'll skip to the third paragraph there. Mm -hmm. However, it is unclear why Muhammad later said the bell is the musical instrument of Satan. And we'll go again. Holy Prophet Muhammad, according to um, I'm not sure, I probably won't be pronouncing this right, but Amra Shabah Bill mentioned to his wife Khadija that he feared he was possessed by demons and wondered whether other cons consider him possessed. These statements about the physical sentence exhibited by Muhammad when he saw the spirit were not made by strangers, non-Muslims, or people who did not know him. These statements were made by Aisha, Muhammad's favorite wife, relatives, and his close followers who strongly believe that he was the seal of the prophets. All these people happened to be very committed Muslims who knew the alleged prophet well. So we see here that he was visited by spirit and he thought it may be Gabriel, but sometimes he thinks he was possessed and he used to run to his wife, Khadija. So we see here, there's not something clear. So it's something coming from the bottomless pit. It's not from God. So just history, you can find these things to, um, to see these things. So um, if we continue, um, let me make my thing here, okay. Over the time, Muhammad started having some doubt about the revelation he received from the Spirit. Allah, God, directed Muhammad to check the truth from the Bible. If thou were in the doubt as thou what he has revealed unto thee, then ask those who have been reading the book from before thee. So in, it's in the Shara Yunus 10 and um, 94. So Muhammad fell from heaven knowing about the Bible, the Sabbath, the true God, but started his own religion anyway, talking to spirits. Mm. So we see the aspect of the bottomless spit, a star that formed from heaven. And we know uh, Lucifer knew about the law of God in heaven. And he still fought, he still came with his own doctrine and his own precept lying to the angel so we see the same counterfeit happening in the, the new religion uh muslim happening knowing that um muhammad was visited by spirits so um so we see here that i beheld satan as a lightning fall from heaven and i saw a star from from heaven unto the earth so we see the parallel here and um, we saw Jesus was also a star from heaven when he was, uh, he was born. So we see somebody can be looked upon as a star. And uh, Lucifer was the son of the morning, uh, or that cut down from the ground, which this weakened the nation, Isaiah 14, verse 12. So let's continue. And another aspect that maybe some people know or doesn't know, there was also a falling star. They call it the black stone. Islam worshipped the meteorite. So they believed that there was a meteorite that fell in Saudi Arabia. And they, for them, it's like that star also. Muslims make their pilgrimage to Mecca circling the, the Kadaba and giving a nod or a kiss to the meteorite that is said to rest inside. So not only you can make the parallel with Mohammed, but also there's a meteorite that fell in Saudi Arabia. So uh, I'll just read uh, Jude, verse 13, raging wave of sea forming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So that new religion is coming with some objects, some new guy prophets, spirit is talking to him. So let's keep uh, diving here. So Carl, can you read uh, 
the, the text on top. A mysterious dark rock rests in the corner of the Kaaba, a square black building found at the center of the Grand Mosque in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Each year, devout Muslims make uh, the pilgrimage to Mecca, circling the Kaaba and giving a nod or a kiss to the meteorite that is said to rest inside. Scientists and historians debate the origin of the stone, but have not been able to determine whether the black stone is a meteorite or not, as the rock is not permitted to be removed from its silver casing for examination. The worship of the black stone goes back to pre-Islamic shrines when some Semitic cultures use unusual stones to signify sites of reverence. According to Muslim belief, the stone origi originates from the time of Adam and the Islamic prophet Muhammad set the black stone in place after it fell from the skies. Wow. So you can see the mix of doctrines from the Bible, Adam, and you go back to his own interpretation and you see people going around that square and that stone is inside uh, that black stone. But it we love to talk about the sanctuary and the Bible meds. And it seems like a hollow square, just a counterfeit. So we know the sanctuary was in the middle and there was an open space. And if you look at uh, the Mecca, it's an open space and people are around it. But you see how the enemy is trying to have his own hollow square compared to the genuine sanctuary. And um, here again, we see that here and the tribes are around, but now they're worshiping a stone. But in, in the sanctuary, we have the table of stone, the, in the most holy place, the law of God. So you see stone for stone. One is a stone, there's no writing, but one stone, there's the finger of God with the 10 commandments. So you see the counterfeit here from the bottomless pit. So there's the uh, yep. There's all, uh, what my mind immediately went to, which was, you know, after the Babylonian captivity, mm -hmm. the Jews did not have an ark. Yep. All they had was a stone. Oh, yes. All they had was a stone. And that was, um, was it the stone no, where so Abraham place. sacrificed Isaac? the stone of Mount Moriah. And it makes me think of whenever Jesus said, your house is left unto you desolate. And mm -hmm. they still continued to worship at that useless stone. God's glory was not there anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Nick, for that point, because Jesus was the covenant. He was that person they were supposed to, he was the desire of ages that they were supposed to look up to, mm -hmm. but they still kept going after that stone in the most holy place and not look to Jesus. So we need the living stone, Jesus Christ, and look up to him. So thank you um, for that point. So um, also in, um, in Islam, they also have that key of the bottomless pit. So Nick, can you read these two texts? Yes. Uh, you see in Matthew 16, 18, 18 through 19, it says, and I say also unto thee, unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee, unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And in Matthew 23, 13, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. So uh, th thank you, Nick, for the reading. So we see the key of heaven, and we know the papers also have the keys uh, on their logo, 
but also Islam, also have the key of the bottomless pit. So now let's see in history if they have. So they they are the one opening it from um, the bottomless pit. So here um, we know is Jesus who really have the authority over his church, but he's using us to share the gospel so the, the kingdom can be open to people and not do like the Jews where the kingdom is closed because they're teaching false doctrine. So we have to understand the concept of the keys and the false doctrine because if you're preaching something false, that person might have a wrong interpretation of Christ. So... Um, we see here, um, Paul, can you read? Yep. Um, is that Sheba? Or Sh yep, Sheba. The Sheba family are the keepers of the keys, and they are the keepers because Allah desired so by revealing the only ayat that was revealed inside the Kahaba and Masjid al-Haram. Indeed, Allah commands you to render trust to him, to whom they are belong to. Yutnam Tala was a companion of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Before the conquest of Mecca, he was the keeper of the key to the Kahaba. He was therefore known as the Satan of Mecca. Since Muhammad handed the key to the Kahaba over to him, Descendants of Muhammad's companions have been inheriting the key and the title Satan of the Kahaba to this day. So thank you. So even in history, you can see they, they have a key and Muhammad give it to, uh, to the Kahaba and to the descendant. So you see that new religion has a rock, has a key. Um, as a new teaching, spirits are talking to him, all these things to show the accuracy of the Bible because they're going to play a major role also. So um, we see here the Quran, the Muslim Bible continues to speak of the key of God, which opened to them the gates of the world of religion. So in the Quran, did not God give the legal uh, the legate Muhammad, the power of heaven, which is above and fire, which is beneath. With the key, did he not give him the title and power of a order that he may open those whom he shall have chosen? So you see the confusion here. Whenever a convert from the Muslim religion was accepted into the faith of the Greek church, he had to state his rejection of the Muhammad pretended key of heaven. So, so how, all that you can see that in history. So um, from Gibbon, describe the inspiration that Muhammad received. Each year during the, the, the month of the Ramadan, he redraw from the world into the cave of Era three miles from the Mecca and consult the spirit of fraud and enthusiasm whose abode is not in the heaven, but in the mind of the prophet. So all these things to show the thing about this religion. So there's something now we're going to go deeper in verse two. And he opened the bottomless pit and there, there arose a smoke out of the pit. How does the smoke a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So what does that symbolize? So if you remember the last study, we, uh, I think the last, uh, the fourth trumpet, when we said the sun was darkened one third and the moon and the stars. So here we see darkening in the sun. So here we know Christ also is the son of righteousness in Malachi 4.2. Or here the leader is able to release smoke that darkened the sun and air. The sun represents Christ, the light of the world, and also represents the truth. And also the air can represent the Holy Spirit, 
you know? So all these things to show that there's a, there's a counterfeit happening and we need to play close attention uh, to the symbol of revelation. So um, like John 3, 8, the wind blows where it uh, is listed and thou hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So it's everyone that is born of the spirit. So the air and the, now the smoke. So if the, the, the air is blocked, darkened, and the sun, when you think about the fourth day of creation, you have sun, moon, and stars. So now you have the sun that's, so you only have moon and stars left. And isn't it funny, that is the religion of Islam. You don't see the sun, but you see the star and the moon, the crescent moon. So just to show again the curse of the Bible, Nick? Yeah, so I was, I was, I was reading the verse and what struck out to me, which was uh -huh. um, the smoke or whatever, mm -hmm. um, how long you can breathe and smoke. Not, not very long at all. No, and, not, not very long. and we understand this as happening in the 1260 year period of the papal supremacy. Mm -hmm. But we also consider that the dark ages. Mm. And also what they were doing was they were persecuting God's church. So you have the fires of persecution. Mm -hmm creating the smoke wow and it's suffocating it's literally suffocating and those it's people, suffocating the christ, uh, christ or righteousness because christ yeah. cannot shine in in the midst of all this and and think about it the the papacy i mean they uh, they did it to themselves almost you know they presented a religion that was so bad that mm -hmm. another religion <laughs> was formed which is equally you know, not, um, not according to the Bible. Mm -hmm. And you have this just great confusion coming and clashing together, With creating them. this big smoke, this furnace and everything. Thank you for uh, this input. So we can see how rich the Bible is just by going through the symbol. We can see the Bible can interpret itself. And you can parallel that with history. And that's why we love the Bible. So here in Revelation 9, 3, and they came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And on them was given power. The scorpion of the, of the earth ha have power. So we see here the symbol of the locusts. Why the locusts? So... Um, Paul, can you read um, uh, the red and the blue? And out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. The locusts are undoubtedly symbolic. In the fifth trumpet, there are at least four symbolic creatures, the locust, the horse, the lion, and the scorpion. Our Arabs, it says, for they came up with their cattle and their tents and they came as grasshoppers for multitude for both they and their camels were without number and they entered into the land to destroy it judges chapter 6 verse 5 the medianites and the amalekites and the which were arab tribes the and the medianites and the amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude and their camels were without number, as the sand by the seaside for multitude. Judges chapter 7, verse 12. And then in Nahum chapter 3, starting from verse 15, There shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm, make thyself many as the locust, thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. 
canker worm spoileth the and fleeth away. Thy crown are as the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges of the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. Amen. So thank you for the reading. So we can see the symbol of the locusts or the symbol of the Medina, the uh, Malachites, so the Arabs. And they, where are they coming from? From the east. So all these symbols of that bottomless pit uh, kingdom that's coming, Islam, they have their own description, and that's this why you can see also the four symbol. They have locust, horse, lion, and scorpion. So uh, we we see a swarm of these insects darkening the air and appear as a distance, like clouds of smoke. So so when they're coming, they they they're like a cloud. So you see all. The, the symbol we just described before, the smoke and the stars and all these things, but because they're, they, they have a big numbers, they're like locusts, just like uh, the plagues of Egypt, one of the plagues. So all these symbols, you just have to follow them closely and understand where in history that happened. So um, if we continue... Um, so the rise of Muhammad uh, at the juncture, however, like a meteorite from the blue, there came in the world a new religion, a religion primarily of power and not, how, not of love, a militant fanaticism uh, appealing partially to, to the evil which lies in men and only partly to the good. So uh, let me move my... In here, hold on. Authorities have recognized that the religion of Muhammad was the key that opened the abyss. And as it were, set the Arab cause in motion, Gibeon said. The Arab uh, languish in poverty and contempt till Muhammad breathed into those savage orders and soul of enthusiasm. So I'm just reading a little bit of history, but you, you get the picture of the Bible right now. So as Christian, we know we're dealing uh, right here, right now with the papacy, just like we saw, Pontifus Maximus and all that. We have Islam and we even have atheism. We're not gonna discuss atheism today against Christ, true Christianity. You have papacy, Islam, and atheism. So as a Christian, you need courage in this world to know your Bible and to stand for Jesus. And that's why it's so important that we go through the study right now to see the conflict in the world. So um, um, Nick, can you read the first two up there, uh, Ezekiel 2.6 and the little red and blue. Yeah, no problem. This is, I believe, is talking about the scorpions. Yep. And Ezekiel 2.6, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions be not afraid of their words nor be dismayed at their looks though they be a rebellious house in the fifth trumpet there are at least four symbolic creatures we went over the locust the horse the lion and now the scorpion so so thank you nick so we see in ezekiel 2 6 the symbol of the scorpion it's like they have a false doctrine but they want to sting you and remember in Revelation 12, the dragon took one third with the tails. So we see the tail, that's the power of the scorpion. So God is trying to illustrate the same aspect of the dragon, but through a different animal, the scorpion. 
So he he's telling not to be afraid or dismay of their looks. So is this is the same symbol. The scorpion represents demons. Uh, the key body part of the scorpion is the tail, and the tail represents lies. You can see that in uh, Isaiah 9.15 and uh, John 8.44, the father of lies, Satan. This is why Satan tells drew a third part of the angel and cast them to the earth. This army has all the biblical characteristics that are applied to Satan, scorpion, serpent, lion, locust, sulfur, bottomless pit, etc. This clearly is a manifestation of satanic power. And you see how they pick over in the map. Mm. Um, they come like locusts. So you see Africa and Arabia and India, how when they come, they come from east and from the bottom and they take over. So, so just to show in history, you can, in your own time, look at these things. So now we're going to go to verse 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green things, neither any tree. Only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. So now it's like this power is receiving order from God to hurt a specific people. Not those who have the seal of God. So, um, so we know there's many symbols in the Bible. And uh, like tree. It represents the people of God. It is clear that vegetation here represents the faithful people of God. Psalm 1, 1 to 3, Jeremiah 17, 8, Psalm 92, 12. Not hurting those who have the seal on their forehead is synonymous to not hurting the vegetation. This is not to be understood as the end time seal of God, but rather as the gospel seal. Ephesians 1, 13. Ephesians 4.30 and 2 Timothy 2.19 and 2 Corinthians 1.22. Great things here means God's true people who were not attacked by this power, but those who had not God's seal refer to the apostate Christendom. So, so pretty much here we have text about grass. These people as God is Isaiah 47. I'm not going to read all this. The God is compared as a tree of righteousness in Isaiah 61 3, etc., and lie down in green pastures, Psalm 23 2. So, here, um, maybe uh, Nick, can you read the red part only? Sure. <clears throat> it says, Destroy no palm trees, nor burn any field of corn, cut down no fruit trees nor do any mischief to cattle, only such as you kill to eat. When you make a covenant, stand to it and be as good as your word. As you go on, you will find some religious persons who live retired in monasteries and propose to themselves to serve God that way. Let them alone, neither kill them nor destroy their monasteries. And you will find another sort of people that belong to the synagogue of Satan who have shaven crowns be sure you cl cleave their skulls and give them no quarter till they either turn uh, Mahometans or pay tribute. So we see here, there's a group of people not to touch and there's a group of people to touch. But the text says who have a shaved crown. So what is this? So we can see here, they were actually attacking the monks of the Catholic Church here. So um, maybe, Carl, can you read uh, the statement, even in the 7th century? Even in the 7th century, the monks were generally, gener generally laymen, sorry. They wore their hair long and disheveled and shaved their heads when they were ordained priests. The circular tonsure was sacred and mysterious. It was the crown of thorns, but it was likewise a royal diadem, and every priest was a king. Those who do not have the seal of God in their forehead 
To have the seal of God upon your mind is to hate evil and to love that which is good. Ezekiel 9, 4. It is to reflect the character of God and to keep his commandments, including the fourth, Ezekiel 20, 12, and Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Only those who accepted the counterfeit papal Sabbath suffered under the Islamic onslaught. So we see here those symbol of uh, Tonshur. It's also like the sun god. If you look from uh, above, so all these symbol they were they were not considered for Islam as true Bible believers. So I, Nick, you wanted to say something. Uh, um. Uh, it left me. I'll I'll think of it in yeah. a little bit. <laughs> All right. So um, also there was a group that was keeping the Sabbath in that time. It was the Coptic Church. So the Sabbath observance from the Coptic source. So you can see that the result of the struggle was completely uh, an isolation, severe, severe persecution of the Coptic Church at the hands of the ruling Byzantine Empire. And although the cop did accept certain tradition and institution from the church, the Christian churches, yet their hesitancy to give up all the tradition caused them on many occasions to incorporate both the old and the new of their canons and the church law, the conservation, uh, conservatism on the part of the Coptic Church of Egypt in every useful, reconstructive, the development of various institutions during the early years of the Christian church. So uh, we see here in their writing how they kept also the Sabbath. The present preliminary study deals with the Coptic Orthodox stand regarding the seven-day Sabbath as illustrated by the Coptic version of the statu stat statutes of the apostles, commonly known in many publications as the apostolic constitution of canonist Ecclesiastes. So, so you, you see here that some people that kept the Sabbath even in the dark uh, ages or the persecution that was happening with, um, with the papal system. And we know it was the custom of Jesus to keep the Sabbath. So it's not something only in the Old Testament it was his custom. He went in the singer on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So all this. So here, the Church of the East. In the early century, the Christian era, the Church of the East, not the Western of Latin church, sometimes called a, a Syrian church, sometimes in the Nostrian church, who were observe, observers of the true Sabbath very effectively spread through Asia and the East, but remained separate from the church in the West, especially the apostasy. The true Christian became the teachers of the Sarensen and were responsible for es establishing an educational system in Syria, Mesopotamia, uh, Turkestan, Tibet, China, India, Ceylon, and other hmm. areas. Wow. So just to show how God was trying to keep those who keep his commandment, who were revering the Sabbath, he said, don't touch these people, but touch, only touch those who have that crown, who are the monks, because they were having a false religion. So when the Arabian Empire was fully established, it built a Baghdad and man, a magnificent new capital, the Church of the East removed its spiritual capital from Seleucia to Baghdad and where it remained for approximately the next 500 years. To his Christian subject, true Christian, not the apostate one whom the Arabs tormented, Ma Mahomet readily granted the security of their person, the freedom of their trade, the property of their goods, and the toleration of their worship. So God really used this system, even though they came from the bottomless pit to attack papal Rome and protect his people. Hmm. Isn't it God good? <laughs> so, uh, uh, Nick? 
Yeah, and <clears throat> it's amazing because I, I think of um, uh, the story of Nebuchadnezzar and yep. God. And it's amazing that even though you have this power, um, you know, from the bottomless pit, mm-hmm. he's saying you guys are only going it prophesying. Mm-hmm. He's saying you guys are only going to be attacking this false religion. But my religion, you guys are going to kind of protect and by protecting them, you'll be exposed to what they have. To what I have given them. Mm. Amen. Amen. It's like Daniel, it's like uh, Daniel and uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel was God's witness to Nebuchadnezzar. Exactly. So thank you for um, for this point to show how God was protecting his people in that time in Revelation 9-4. So now we're in Revelation 9-5. And unto them it was given that they should not kill them, but how they should be tormented five months and the torment was as the torment of a scorpion when they're striking a man. So now we're going to see the strike. So um, how can you read that part? Yep. They were not given power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. Scorpions rarely kill human beings when they sting them, but they cause excruciating pain, swelling and suffering, even to the point of wanting to die. Man, they were not to kill them, but torment them for five months. Five prophetic months is equal to 150 literal years, 30 by five for 150. For 150 years from 674 to 824, the Muslim armies repeatedly attacked Constantinople, capital of the Orthodox Catholic Church, but they never succeeded to fully conquer it during that mm. time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so 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 we you see the history how God is is in control of the whole Bible and he's protecting his word, but he's also trying to get something out of papal Rome to repent. All these things, God is trying to repent, but they, they are not repenting, and they have to go through 150 years. So we know about a day for a year prophecy, according to Ezekiel 4.6 and Numbers 14.34. And Dr. Josea Litch, um, one of the pioneer, understood that, that calculation in 1843, Dr. Uh, Lich interpreted this prophecy to the Islamic religion, and that the time prophecy related to the rise of the Ottoman Empire. So this is the rule of interpretation, a day for a year, Numbers 1434, Ezekiel 4, 6. So you can read it on your own time. So here, if you take um, five months, and according to Genesis, the Bible, we it's all, all 30 days for each month. So if you do five multiplied by 30, it gives you 150 days, but now you have to put it for a year. So, Nick? Yeah, and I, um, I wanted to mention that um, it was even before uh, 1843 that Josiah Litch came up with that prophecy because mm-hmm. um, what what uh, what ended up happening was is they had this great principle, which was the year day principle, mm-hmm. and they had previous prophecies that they're like the timeline matches completely. And then whenever they got to, you know, the fifth and sixth trumpet, where you go over the sixth trumpet, it was something that was going to happen in their day, and they were going to wait for that time. And whenever that prophecy ended up being Happening. fulfilled it just sparked this yeah. amazing <laughs> movement in multiple mm-hmm. churches about jesus is coming again and so because of uh god blessing josiah lich and his study of the prophecies we have this wonderful principle for the day for a year 
Amen, amen. Amen. So, uh, yeah, so so we're going to go on the sixth trumpet and we're going to see that it's still being applied. And just like Nick stated, that's how 1844 came about. It wasn't uh, fable. It wasn't something out of air with thin air. No, it was solid from the Bible. So uh, when Amen. did the when did the 150 years started? According to Edward Gibbon, the Ottoman first entered the territory of Nicomedia on the 27th, 27th of July. 1299, started to attack Eastern Rome and finished in 1449. So you just add the 150, the five months, that's 150 years plus that date, and you end up in 1449. So during the whole period of the Ottoman Turk, were engaged in perpetual war with the Greek Empire, but yet without conquering it. But in 1449, a change came. Nick? And I, I also wanted to mention, because I know that there was two dates or whatever mm-hmm. in, um, in your presentation. Mm-hmm. Five months is repeated twice in the fifth trumpet. So whenever mm-hmm. you had the dates of the Saracens or whatever, and their conquest of tormenting but not conquering, mm-hmm. that... Uh, that 150 years, I believe in, let me see if I can't pull it up here, in Revelation 9, verse, oh, man, where is it? Um, let me see. Uh, <clears throat> verse 10, mm-hmm. it was, uh, that's the second time that the five months was mentioned. Oh, which they okay. were given power to hurt, mm-hmm. and that's where this date is coming from. This Amen. was the second application the, of that. The second application. Thank you for um, adding this. So in the meantime, can you also read the text uh, on the screen right now? Oh, yes. Uh, this is talking about the fall of Constantinople in May 29th, 1453. Uh, four years later, the conquest of Constantinople by Sultan uh, Mahmud uh, II of the Ottoman Empire. The dwindling Byzantine Empire came to an end when the Ottomans breached Constantinople's ancient land wall after besieging the city for 55 days. Uh, Mahmud uh, surrounded Constantinople from land and sea while employing cannon to maintain a constant barrage of the city's formidable walls, the fall of the city removed what was once a powerful defense for Christian Europe against Muslim invasion, allowing for uninterrupted Ottoman expansion in Eastern Europe. So thank you. So now the fall is complete four years later. So from 1449 to 1453. So we see here the accuracy of the Bible and how God is using this power. Um, hold on a second, I have to move right now. So in the year 1448, John Polyugus, the Greek emperor died, but left no children to inherit his throne. And in 1449, Constantine, Yekos, Yekos succeeded it. So another one, maybe call. Can you read that? Yep. He, however, would not venture to ascend the throne without the consent of Amurath, the Turkish Sultan. This was a voluntary surrender of the sovereignty. Sovereignty, sorry. Mm-hmm. This war ends in 1449 and the second war starts. So here, we, ju- we just have a graphic here to show you uh, this uh, Islamic attack against the Catholic nation of Western Europe. So how it was happening, and you see the scorpion and all that. So we are about to pretty soon um, enter the sixth trumpet. 
So whatever they tried, to, uh, the Arab were unable to conquer Eastern and Western Rome, but they fell twice to the fate of Constantinople. So here, uh, they will desire to die and death will flee from them. It's interesting to note that when the Catholic Church would rise against the Sabbath-keeping Waldenses and Reformers, then the Islamic Arab would rise against the Catholic nation of Europe and weaken the church's ability to persecute the Protestant. So, so God is in charge you know, of our lives when we stand for him. Mm-hmm. And um, they will desire to die and they, they will flee from them. So because of the constant torment of war and attack upon the Eastern Roman Empire in, in Constantinople, the people were, may have felt deaf was preferable to life. However, given the tenacity of the human spirit, they carried on and lived through the horrors of the Islamic invasion. Mm. So, uh, uh, Nick, can you read the statement about Martin Luther? Yeah, you want me to just read the blue and the red? Yep. Okay. God's providence had held in check the forces that opposed the truth. Again and again, the immediate destruction of all who dared to oppose themselves to Rome appeared inevitable. But at the critical moment, the armies of the, of the Turk appeared on the eastern front, or the king of France, or even the pope himself, jealous of the increasing greatness of the emperor, made war upon him, and thus amid the strife and tumult of nations, the Reformation had been left to strengthen and extend. Amen. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> and another one here. All right. And in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, support and encouragement for Protestants and Calvinists were one of the fundamental principles of Ottoman policy. There would have been no Protestantism had there been no Turk. Oh, man. Oh, man. That's just- Not as good. That is good. So you that is a marvel at this. History. You got a marvel. Yep. So so sometimes God wants us to do something. He's gonna use another nation fighting another nation so the truth can move on. Yep. So so just a little history. If people that know Islam, people usually keep Friday as the Sabbath. Mm. And the Sabbath keepers keep Sabbath. And people who switch for Sunday, they keep the first day. So you see the battle on that weekend from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, how it's going to come about. And the world wants to keep Sunday because of the papacy. So this is the battle that all Christians will have to stand on the truth or tradition. So why is that? So... We know that um, Islam also, Ishmael came from Abraham. And uh, from, from that, we know uh, he was not the son of the promise because he didn't wait. He listened to his wife, but he redeemed himself and God gave him the son of the promise. But also when he went, when, he, when Agar departed with Ishmael, he was not happy. And in later days, Ishmael repented of his evil ways, returned to his father's God, but the stamp of character given to his prosperity remained. The powerful nation descended from him, where a turbulent heathen people were ever an annoyance and affliction to the descendants of Isaac. So we see here they will persecute uh, also the descendant of Isaac, and God, in his mercy, gave this nation 12 princes, just like the 12 tribes. And you can see that in Genesis 17, 20. And, uh, but God also stated in Genesis 16 that they, they will be like a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man against him. So, there was a prophecy about Ishmael that he will go against other nations. So just to show us 
the accuracy from Genesis to Revelation, how everything is being fulfilled, even when we make mistakes. So, <laughs> so we, we see the spread of Islam in the world, million in def- different countries, and they're a group that God wants to reach also because they came from Abraham. So, so we, we should not forget that. And when we don't keep the Sabbath, terror comes. So the reign of terror, you remember in the Old Testament when the Israelites were not keeping the Sabbath, other nations came after them because they were in idolatry. When you're in idolatry, you also break the Sabbath. You don't have the peace of God in your land. So all these texts to show when you keep the Sabbath, you have peace. When you don't keep it, you're at war. So, so here, um, we, uh, we're going to Revelation 9, 7. So, um, Paul, can you read that? Revelation 9, 7. Yep. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. Mm-hmm. What time? So, yeah, you can read. Continue. Job 39, 18 to 22. What time she lifteth up herself on high, she scorneth the horse and his rider. Has thou given the horse strength? Has thou clothed his neck with thunder? Can thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostril is terrible. He poweth in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth on the meet on to meet the armed men. He mocketh at fear and is not affrighted, neither turneth he back from the sword. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Proverbs mm, chapter amen. 21, verse 31. Amen. So we see these locusts also have the symbol of horses going to battle. So, and uh, their heads were like crown of gold and their face as the face of a man. So you can see them uh, with their turban and their horses and they're like grasshoppers. So God is really uh, putting a lot of description for um, the Ottoman Empire, the Arabs, the Muslim to show you how they're being used and they how they outnumber um, when mm. they come in to attack. So the shape of locusts was like horses prepared for battle. So we saw that. So um, Joel 2 verse 4, the appearance of them as the appearance of horses and horsemen who shall, uh, so shall they run. So all these symbols, you can really find a Bible text to understand how uh, the Ottoman Empire was attacking on their head was a crown, something like gold. So, uh, Carl, can you read that middle part? On their heads were a crown like gold, crowns and symbols of kingship. Satan used nations and kingdoms to propagate the errors of Islam. The crowns like gold could also be a reference to the turbans worn mm. by the Arab invaders. So, th- thank you. So, all these things. So. <clears throat> Their face like the face of a man. Can you read that, to Nick? The fact that the horses have human faces could symbolize that Satan's lies were propagated through human agents, Muhammad and his followers. Amen. So, so all these symbols here are pretty clear and called the blue part. Thus, it is not surprising that the Muslim cavalry and battle appeared to John as locusts in number and looked like horses. John's expressions on their heads were as it were like as it were crowned like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, is his interpretation of the Muslim warrior and their brightly colored turbans. Mm. So thank you. So we see here they had hair as the hair of a woman, and their teeth were the teeth of a lion. So their turban, it's like, like a hare. So when they're on their horses, 
you see them floating. It's like a hair of a woman. So all these symbols, God is really, really descriptive for you not to miss the mark about this nation. So, um, uh, Nick, can you read uh, the purple and the red? Yep. Uh, this is found in Joel 1 6. Teeth are the teeth of a lion. He hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. And in Psalms 57 4, my soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. So, so we see here that the aspect of lying, the vicious, and they, they're not afraid because lion is a king of the jungle. So just to show all these uh, symbols, Carl, can you read this text? Um, Ezekiel twenty three forty two, and a voice of a multitude being at ease was with her. And with the men of the common sort were brought Sabaeans from the wilderness, which put bracelets upon their hands and beautiful crowns upon their heads. So Amen. here again, Sabaeans, the Arabs, so all these symbols from the Bible. So mm -hmm. a few years back, we know about Osama, all these things. So you see all their turban, like hair, etc. You see here are the pictures. So make a point wearing turban because it, it was the way of angels, Muhammad says. So, Nick? You know, I, I thought men weren't supposed to cover their heads. <laughs> <laughs> I and know, but... I yeah. thought that the woman, which makes sense, they had hair of, as a woman or whatever... Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I forget what the verse was. I remember you sharing it with me, but the covering of the hair's women, uh, the woman's yep. hair or mm -hmm. whatever. And it had something it's to do with women. angels. It had yep. something to do with angels. And so it's just amazing how, like, how twisted <laughs> when Muhammad is saying, make a point of wearing turbans because it is the way of angels. And it's like, that's kind of backwards. A, 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 exactly. So... Yeah. So when I think it's First Corinthians um, eleven, 11 yep. where the hair, because of the hierarchy in the family, men, the covering of men is Jesus, and the covering of a woman is a man. And angels look at this, follow the order. There's order in heaven, there's ranks. And it's funny, there's in the sanctuary, the veil, that's angel that's over the veil in a whole a most holy place, all these things. So you see the order of veil. So Satan is, is a copycat. He's giving this symbol to Muhammad about the veil of the sanctuary. Hmm. So it's a good point that you brought that up because I didn't think about that until the sanctuary. I'm like, oh yeah, that's true. Because uh, yeah, the angels are in the veil. So yeah. all these things. So um, if we continue... Uh, you know, Satan is described as a roaring lion who he may devour. So the same thing with this nation, but with the courage of a lion. So uh, the breastplate. So uh, Carl, can you read that? Yep. And they had breastplate as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. Revelation chapter 9, verse 9. The Christian's armors consist of a breastplate which symbolizes righteousness. Ephesians 6, 14. The breastplate of the enemy would then symbolize unrighteousness. Unrighteousness is disobedience to God's law. 1 John 3, 4. By encouraging disobedience to God's law, Satan has made the truth almost impenetrable to the heart of Muslims. Mm -hmm. So, so you see, they have the breastplate, but it's not a breastplate of righteousness. But they being used to attack people, Rome. But you see, is the same false religion type thing and false doctrine that's fighting. 
So um, the tale of Scorpion, we saw its false teaching. We saw that before. And uh, the Turk standard of the three horse tail. So we can see it here. The ensign of one, two or three horse tail that marks distinctively the dignity and power of the Turkish Pasha. So, so the horse, the tails, the, the crescent moon, all these symbols, you can see them in um, Revelation 9.10, and that they're like a scorpion, and they were uh, sting in their tail, and their power was to hurt men five months. So the five months again, like Nick was saying, um, is, is coming again. So, um, so uh, we read this also. So Constantinople, we read this also. So here, uh, maybe some people know about this guy, the Suleiman, the Magnificent Attack Europe, Vienna, every year. So Suleiman was known as the fair ruler and opponent of corruption. It is known that west of Suleiman, the Magnificent, and the Islamic world has the law giver. So, so he has he did military conquests, and um, we can see that. So, uh, Nick, can you read Revelation 9-11? Yes. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abed, and in the Greek tongue, have his name, Apollyon. And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. It is not natural for locusts to have a king over them. In Proverbs 30, 27, we read, the locusts have no king, yet they yet go they forth, uh, all of them by bands. The locusts in the present passage, however, are highly organized and are very effective in their propagation of error. Mm -hmm. And can you continue on uh, these oh, yeah. modern pets? Uh, the rise of Muhammad was in 612 AD, and for a long time after his death, there was no central king over them. Each tribe had its own ruler, but in, 20, in 1299, Othman became king in what we call the Ottoman Empire was set up. We know that the five months begins at this time because the prophecy, prophecy says they have a king. <laughs> wow. Yep. <laughs> so that, that, that's how we, uh, we go to the prophecies. And um, so, Carl, can you read uh, from the purple part whose name? Whose name? A transliteration of the Hebrew meaning destruction and ruin. Satan's plan is to destroy faith in God mm -hmm. and thus bring about spiritual ruin. Napoleon means one who destroys a destroyer, a fitting description of the Muslim armies. Mm -hmm. So more. this, yep, you can, you can read. Uh, Revelation 9, 12, one woe is past and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. One woe is past, the sixth trumpet brings to view the final demise of the Eastern the final demise of the Eastern Empire under the cruel warfare of the Ottoman Empire. So the sixth trumpet, the war of Turkish Islam. So the sixth trumpet sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, mm. which is before God. Um, Revelation 9, 13. And you know, the altar is also prayer. And um, it's before the veil in the sanctuary. You can see that in the graphic. And uh, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar. This is the same altar where incense was offered upon to God with the prayer of the saints who were crying out for vengeance upon the apostate church. Revelation 6, 9, and 10. The golden uh, altar before the veil in the wilderness of the Talmud had been had four horns upon which blood was sprinkled. So we see here, seeing the sixth trumpet, which had the, the trumpet lose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. You see here the explanation. Previously, the prophet had seen four angels 
that restrain the winds of strife from blowing. Revelation 7, 1. But these four angels bring strife and destruction. The word angel means messenger. In a prophecy, angels are not always angelic beings, but they can also represent people. These four angels have been uh, identified as the four sultanies of the Turkish Ottoman Empire, the capital of which were Baghdad, Damascus, Aleppo, and Euconium. So uh, now we see the same dark religion power uh, but this time coming from the river Euphrates, which refers to uh, the area of the country of Turkey. So, so Nick? Yeah, and what's interesting is that, um, you know, the focus being on uh, Islam and the Ottoman Empire. And what was interesting is that in the fifth trumpet, what we see is they're only allowed to hurt and to torment mm-hmm. Rome. Mm-hmm. But now what you're seeing is these four angels or these uh, four capitals or four mm-hmm. generals are loose from their restriction of only hurting and only tormenting. Mm-hmm. And I know we're going to be going into that, but I think it's just amazing that God is now saying, all right, uh, Babylon or the papacy, you're not listening. So this is the next trumpet. Yep. It, it, it's more powerful this time. So just to uh, solidify the horses, the four winds are angry horses. Angel are holding the four winds represent as angry horse uh, seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction, death in its path. Selected messages book three, four, or nine. So, just to get the symbol of the horses that that want to be loose. So um, now Revelation nine fifteen. So Nick, can you read it? And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. So when, uh, remember that one prophetic day is equal to one literal year. So prepared for the hour, a day, a month, and a year, a year equals 360 days, 360 years, a month, 30 years, a day, one year, an hour, one 24th of a day, which is 15 days. So the total is 391 years and 15 days. You can continue at the bottom. The significance of this time period was brought to light when Josiah Litch, a Millerite preacher, predicted that based on this time prophecy, the Turkish Empire would submit to the nations of the Western Europe uh, of Western Europe on August 11th, 1840. His prediction was perfectly fulfilled. Amen. So- Amen. So, so thank you. So we see prophecy is being fulfilled step by step, even on the sixth trumpet. And um, how can you just read those uh, two parts at the bottom? From the loosening of the four angels, the last vestige of the Eastern Roman Empire was to come under the control of the Muslim Ottoman Empire. That's the meaning of the phrase, to slay the third part of men. A third part of thee shall die with the pestilence, and with famine shall they consume in the midst of thee. And a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee, and I will scatter a third part into all the winds, and I will draw draw out a sword after them. Ezekiel 5.12, a third part represents those under the affliction of God's judgments for sin and disobedience. Mm. So, so, so thank you. So we see God is trying to get the attention and we went through Jose Alic interpretation before, but we see here uh, what Nick just described. A month is, is 30 days, but when you turn a month is year, 30 years, 360, 
So you're adding all these numbers, 391 and 15 days. So if we started from July 27, 1299 plus 150, it gave us July 27, 1499. So from July 27, 1449 plus 391 years, give us July 27, 1840. But you need to add 15 days to July 27, 1840, and we'll give you August 11, 1140. So when did this, the time predict that start? At the end of the fifth trumpet, 2749, Josiah Lich predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire would happen sometime in August 1840, weeks before the date it then narrowed to 11, uh, to 11 August 1840. So, so just the prediction is marvelous. So, so Nick, can you read the statement? Yes, it is from the Great Controversy pages 334 and 335. And this, I believe, will be found to be the case. Josiah Litch in Signs of the Times, an expositor of prophecy, August 1st, 1840. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. Wow. Amen. And the second Amen. one? At the very time specified, and this is page 335, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the Allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller both in the preaching and in publishing his views. And from 1840 to 1844, the work rapidly extended. Amen. 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 That was so, an exciting time to be in. Oh, man. Can you imagine just like you're waiting for August 11th to just come and then bam, and it, it happens. And it happens. Just, oh, exactly. man. Exactly. So we see the timeline from Muhammad from the fifth trumpet, to the sixth. So you see the precision of the rule of interpretation. And uh, we see we had a chart. Oh, I and love you that see chart. here the, the, the Ottoman Empire, the two forces at the bottom right. So, so now you're going to see where's the seventh. So we will get to that very soon so Carl can you read the statement yep no new message all the messages given from 1840 to 1844 are to be made forcible now for there are many people who have lost their bearings blessed are the eyes which saw the things that were seen in 1843 and 1844 the message was given and there should be no delay in repeating the message for the signs of the times are fulfilling. The closing work must be done. A great work will be done in a short time. A message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. Then Daniel will stand in his lot to give his testimony. Manuscript Releases, Volume 21, page 437. So because the sixth trumpet, August 11, 1840, was precise it gives power now to the three angels message to be preached so this is why um 1844 is not a joke is really rooted from the bible and other ministers were studying the rule of interpretation and they saw and this is why there was 50,000 people um following the millerite movement because of August 11, 1840. So it wasn't just um, people think it's only 70 Adventists. There were different denominations uh, following this prophecy because of, of the Ottoman Empire when it fell down. So 
So just to show um, all this accuracy, give the power to the three angels message. And um, we, should not, we should not doubt it. The power which stirred the people so mightily in 1844 movement will again be reve- revealed. The third angel's message will go forth, not in the whispering tone, but with a loud voice. So the loud Amen. cry will be repeated. So we remember Revelation 10, where it says prophesy again. Because we can study these things today again, we can give the message with power again. Mm. So, um, Nick? Yeah, so what was interesting is I was, I was doing a little bit of uh, reading, and I remember I had read in one of Jay and Andrew's book, and it's amazing how the pioneers connected the first angel's message with Revelation 10, with the mighty angels saying, the mystery of godliness is to be finished, or and it's to prepare people for the upcoming judgment that was mm-hmm. going to happen. And it was amazing how these people were preaching the first angel's message in 1840, before that event happened. Amen. Amen. And whenever they were doing that, they spoke. Uh, uh, Josiah Litch found the prophecy and it was fulfilled and they could see that the judgment was going to happen. So whenever the first angel's message is saying, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment is upon us. Mm-hmm. It is saying to get ready for this. Amen. Amen. Because it's so accurate. So, so thank you for sharing this. And we, we are wrapping up slowly but we, we have to finish until the seventh trumpet. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, 000, and I heard the number of them. Thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them, having the breastplate of fire and the jessen and the brimstone and the head of the horses were as the head of a lion and the mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. So... So here, the myriad of Turkish horses overspread of, of the frontier of 600 miles from the Taurus as the room and the blood of 130,000, 130,000 Christian was grateful sacrifice <laughs> to the Arabian prophet. So, so here, uh, we see the breastplate, fire red, uh, he has sent blue and sulfur yellow. What is that that? What does it mean to all these colors? Oh, wow. So if you see the Ottoman uh, soldiers, you see the colors that they had on them and the uniform, it, 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 it's, it's precise. The Bible is really precise. And uh, Nick, uh, you can interject. I know I have, I have so much, but uh, <laughs> one of the things that... Um, uh, the principles of revelation is that this is uh, done in symbols. Mm-hmm. Uh, but sometimes the symbols are just uh, an al- allegory right. yep. to, to describe something. And so I always found that helpful whenever reading this text, because like just with the uniform of the uh, army, you see mm-hmm. all, all the colors there and it's just simply amazing. Amen. Amen. So it, it was just like when God named Cyrus by name, you're like, it's in the Bible. He's not even born yet. All these things to show yep. that the Bible is not a, a fairy tale book. For So fire, smoke, and brimstone. So we, we will uh, see the, that the Lord reign upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven and overthrown the cities and the plain and all the habitants of the city, which grew up of the ground. So now what's, what's their fire, smoke and brimstone. So the, the Ottoman empire had uh, mm, the Mohammed yeah. great gun. So not only they were on the horses, they had their guns that shoot fire with their guns. So that's how they describe it like that. So, uh, uh, Paul, can you read the bottom part? 
the crowning conquest. Yep. The crowning conquest for the Ottoman Turks was the overthrow of Constantinople in 1453. The Turks built giant cannons that could shoot a stone ball that weighed 600 pounds over a mile. The cannons could be loaded and fired seven times a day. The cannons finally made a breach in the wall and the conquest of the city quickly followed. Thus it can be seen how fire, smoke, and brimstone led to the overthrow of a third of the Roman Empire. So, wow, wow, so. wow, 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 <laughs> wow. <laughs> so thank, thank you for the history. So we see here all these symbols. When the pistol were held close to the horse, mm. as they rode to the attack, it looked like a fire and brimstone come from the mouth of the horses. Mm. This is also the time that the knight in armor were much used anymore as the armor would not stop the bullets. So, so all these symbols here uh, are perfectly mm. uh, stated, but the, re but the rest did not repent of the works of their hands. So Revelation 9.20, the rest of the men which were not killed by the plagues yet repented not of the works of their hand, that they should not worship devil and idols and gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. So the word man mankind is referred as the Roman Empire, the part of the Roman Empire that had not fallen to the Turk was Eastern Rome under the leadership of the papal power. So the, med the medieval church did not stop the practice of image worship, despise the, the defeats of the sufferers by the invading Islamic Turk. So you see, they did not repent. repent. So you see, God is long suffering to not inflict people with uh, plagues, all these things, but they did not repent. So, so we, Nick, yep. So it, this, you know, whenever you're studying revelation, you got to study this with Daniel. And uh -huh. so in Daniel chapter five, talking about Belshazzar, mm -hmm. it says they drank wine in verse four, they mm -hmm. drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, brass, oh. iron, wood, and stone and mm. so you start to get the picture that what's happening under the sixth trumpet is kind of the same thing that happened to belshazzar mm. which is that mm. the papacy or um babylon in revelation it what it's saying is that they aren't repenting from their sins from the idolatry. what more can i do mine mm. mine tekel you Ferrison. And that's where yeah. you have the three angels message right there. Mm. Amen. Good point. Amen. Good connection. Yeah. So God wants us to repent before we are away in the balance. So, so after the dad didn't repent, the son continue worshiping idol. They had to fall. Babylon, Babylon is falling. So good connection. So the seventh trumpet, we might be in it right now or it's intensifying so the nations are angry we have radical islam but it's much more so at the last trumpet we cannot just focus on islam but all the nation because there'll be no time left so quickly um we see here uh nick can you read um the beginning the red part and the text you be yes Yes, the end of the sixth trumpet in Revelation 9 brought us to the prophecy foretelling the initial fall of the Ottoman Empire in August of 1840. Revelation 10 tells us of the end of all prophetic times, particularly the end of the 2300-year prophecy of Daniel 8.14. Would you like me to continue? Um, I think that's enough. So, okay. of course, we know about the three angels' message. So, you see here the two forces. Um, so the, there's not a third one 
there's a reason for that because it's the end, guys. So we really mm. are in the seventh trumpet or we're entering it uh, vividly because the nation were angry and the Iraq is come. So, so all these things to show, uh, if I read Revelation 11, 15, the seven angels sounded and there were a great voice in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Amen. Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. So we know rumors of war, all these things that we're hearing, <clears throat> nation against nation, pestilence, COVID, all these things are happening and it's getting the people angry. They want to find a solution to stay here. But after that, after the seven trumpet, we are going to get the seven last plague. So if people keep worshiping the idol and they want to stay here, they didn't understand the mystery of godliness. Christ in us, the hope of glory. So Christ was not formed in them. So that's why they're trying to find human solution to their problem. And they're trying to create war, all these things. And it's not worth the world is the strife, and you remember 9-11 when the towers went, the laws are started to change, and they couldn't stop the fire, and the building went down. So we had so suicide bombers, all these, the locusts have no king. So all these aspects of the attacks on America, all these things is to bring the final movement, the, you know, there'll be rapid one. So, uh, Carl, can you read this last statement? There are not many, even among educators and statesmen, who comprehend the causes that underlie the present state of society. Those who hold the reins of government are not able to solve the problem of moral corruption, poverty, pauperism, and increasing crime. They are struggling in vain to place business operations on a more secure basis. If man would give more heed to the teaching of God's word, they would find a solution of the problems that perplex them. Testimonies, Volume 9, 1909. So, so we see here, they're trying to find solution to fix all these things. And I know they come in trying, trying to come with a great reset, all these things, but they're not they're not going to succeed. It's what God says. And this is why we need to secure a salvation in Christ so we can be part of his kingdom that will last forever. So yeah. we know at the end, the false system will gather all Islam all under one system and even destroy the king of the south. Maybe we'll have another study on that. But it's not the day for that. <laughs> but all the, all to say, they they will see sign and wonder, and they will go after the beast. So all to say, we need to wake up. So this is ending the series on the trumpet. I hope you've been blessed. You can watch the parts and ask questions. And I hope you will be ready. And don't do uh, like, Emperor Rome or Papal Rome, where you stubborn and when God has to drop plagues after plagues, because there's a seven last plague that's coming. <coughs> so we need to just trust God and obey, and we will receive, we will not receive these plagues. So I hope you are blessed. So we'll end with uh, our song, and uh, after that, you will hear the voice of Carl. So this is it, the last review. And remember, the deadly wound happened in 1798, and they went down. So the final going down will be with the seven last plague that attach with the last trumpet with the loud cries. And we, we covered that already. Think of our fathers living still in spite of
early. Thank you for this presentation. Man, I wish I was Josiah Litch right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I keep thinking about how exciting that moment was, must have been. You know, you, you, you come up with a number and it's happening right in front of you. And what an amazing time. But what, what, what more amazing than right now to give this three angels message to the world? Amen. We are, we're about to usher Christ's coming. You know, Josiah Litch wanted to do that. Ellen White, all of them, but God is leaving the opportunity to us. Amen. And as we keep studying, I hope and pray that our hearts are ready because only those that are settled in this truth are going to be able to go all the way. So let us not just uh, look at these presentation, but let us make sure we do line upon line. We keep studying. We keep going back and forth. We see the importance of having the Old Testament to really get a deeper understanding of uh, what we see in the Revelation. So hope we're blessed. Keep studying, guys. Uh, keep watching, and uh, let us pray before we close. Father, Lord, thank you for your love and your goodness. Thank you for your word. You love us so much, Lord, and you're always in control. Even, even a religion that was born from error, Father, Lord, you are still able to keep in check and use, mm -hmm. Lord, to protect your people. And we know, Lord, that you're going to do greater things for us in these last days. Thank you for this message. And I pray, Lord, that you keep helping us to dig deeper in your word and be strengthened as we study. In the precious name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone, Amen. for watching Amen. once again. Amen. Till next time.